our second FSGS um, session. Uh, last time we had a marathon session, we talked about the pathology. Um, I don't know if Dr. Uh, Latif is on today. She had some commitments today, so she said she would try to uh, join in, but maybe or maybe not. Um, but we had um, an introduction to the various clinical types of FSGS. Then we had an, a little primer on the pathology. And basically, um, we kind of went through the clinical classification uh, <clears throat> that it is very important to realize that FSGS is not a diagnosis, it's a histopathological lesion. And that's true for all of these big buckets of diseases when electron microscopy and immunofluorescence and light microscopy started becoming available in the 50s and 60s, these were considered diagnoses. We didn't know much more about them. But now we know that these are actually buckets of histopathological lesions and there are many different diseases that actually are trapped in those buckets. Um, so um, the most important distinction here is to figure out the difference between immune permeability factor related FSGS, which presents with classic nephrotic syndrome from all the other types. And the distinction is critical because the permeability factor related FSGS is the only one which responds um, to immunosuppression. The other, uh, the other types of um, FSGS do not. So this is kind of where we were last time. And this is a graphic which is from the KDGO 2020. This is not actually published yet. This is up for public comment, but you can get this on, uh, on the web. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I just uh, copied it from, from, their, uh, from their recommendations, which are out for public comment presently. So what they are suggesting, like we discussed last time, pretty much on those lines, um, is that you've got somebody who's got the FSGS lesion on kidney biopsy. You try to parse them into their clinical syndromes. Somebody with clear nephrotic syndrome, which is hypoalbuminemia and high-grade proteinuria, falls into one bucket. This is likely to end up being a immune factor-related or permeability factor-related FSGS. And this is the guy which is probably going to respond to immunosuppression. On the other hand, you have clear absence of nephrotic syndrome. Um, not, um, may, I, may I request? Mute, I Dr. Ala, your microphone is on mute too. All right. So <clears throat> now, um, so we were talking about the different buckets. So no nephrotic syndrome, that's sort of easy. That's probably not going to end up at that point to be in the nephrotic syndrome bucket. And then these are the guys who kind of straddle the fence. You have significant proteinuria but the serum albumin is more than 30, which means they're, they're not frankly displaying nephrotic syndrome at that point, but they do have um, features of um, high grade or nephrotic range proteinuria. And these are the patients where you look for other things, especially genetic causes and so on and so forth. But some of these patients will eventually drop into this bucket. They will present with full-fledged nephrotic syndrome. And that's the case that I had presented which in our earlier pontifications we thought is going to end up to be some form of a genetic um, type of disease 
leading to nephrotic brain sportinuria because they didn't have nephrotic syndrome at that time, but eventually um, she developed nephrotic syndrome and required uh, immunosuppressive therapy. So this is, this is actually um, going to be the KDGO um, um, recommendation framework for FSGS, which is close to what we were talking about, but we just have to be a little bit careful in this bucket where this may go either which way. And also I'd like to say this was kind of a lot of discussion happened around this, uh, this um, treatment line that KDGO recommends steroids to be the first line of therapy. But the, the, the strength of the recommendation is 1D. And that is because we really don't have great data in any of these circumstances. Most of the studies, there's some studies which are, which are um, at least randomized and they've got uh, um, other forms of therapies as control arms, uh, but very few. Most of these studies are observational as we will a little bit. So before we go on with our journey through FSGS, I would uh, invite Dr. Umar Farooq to um, present his experience when, with one patient um, who had a very difficult course and was navigated very well. Um, but more importantly, you'll kind of hear the patient describing their journey um, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, hand it over to Umar and Umar, if you do you want to share your screen or I can actually bring up your your presentation as well. How would yeah, you? Like I, to... I added, I think, a few slides. So if you sure. could allow me to. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing and then you can pick up your screen. Okay, so can everyone see the screen and hear me? Yes. Looks yes. Okay, so this is um, not very traditional. It's kind of just flipping um, the way I will be presenting. This is patient's journey in patient's words. So my patient actually wrote uh, a blog and she has her own website. So I think the, the my purpose is that just to share the perspective as what go, goes through patients' brains and heads and, and what they go through. I have a couple of um, you know learning points, teaching points, uh, uh, which we which I learned from this patient story, and I think some of those pain points are mutual and common. So I may ask you one or two questions, and if you can just type A B C as a polling way to kind of address that. Um, so this is, so I will start that. Let me go to move this on the side. All right, the patient's own words, June 18th, 2016. Background story, February of that year, she started, patient started with terrible headaches. May of 2016, other symptoms, blurred, blurred vision, swollen eyes. Uh, patient, this was all labeled to stress and anxiety in her life and, you know, how busy patient is. Uh, when headaches were bad, she went to physician, a brain MRI was done, which was not abnormal, which was not okay. Um, and then she gained 10 pounds in one day. So, so her words like 10 pounds in one day. Uh, then, she, then patient noticed my ankles were missing and tree trunks were in their place. I tried to ignore, but by midday, I look like the start, the, the state of marshmallow man. So you probably have seen that. So I called my doctor um, and then I think there was a discussion about a warmer weather and the fact that I was a busy mom of four and um, I'm on my feet most of the day. Fast forward a week later, my weight gain had balloon, another 12 pounds. So 10 pounds and now 12 pounds. The next morning, I received a phone call that my kidneys showed sign of disease and I was scheduled to, for a series of tests. They arrived at diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome on June 1st. Um, and the biopsy report came back. It showed uh, FSTS and she had classic tip lesion. So, um, the next is, so she wrote in her blog, she continues to write, what does the future hold? 
I have four beautiful, happy, amazing children, and I refuse to lay down and miss out on another session of their life. I'm trying my hardest to keep their social calendar just as busy as before my diagnosis. Anyone who knows me know that I'm extremely, extremely competitive, so I won't let this diagnosis win. I will carry on and be my same fun-loving, active, goofy self. Just surprised. I'm fine and will continue to be fine. Please don't worry about me. There are so many people which much worse health issues than me, so I consider myself lucky. If you see me around, please don't waste time talking about this depressing, boring stuff. Instead, compliment my new uh, Kim Kardashian curves, my fuller face to come uh, or break out in a version of Baby Got Back. Now that would be awesome. Enjoy your summer, everyone. So she posted this in her own blog. Every time you are able to find some humor in a difficult situation, you win. Okay, next blog, June 26, 2016. Hello, positivity. Are you still there? Remember that all positivity I had last post? Well, it mm, had pretty bad, uh, pr uh, that thing, the bed pretty fast. Last weekend, I ended up gaining an additional 11 pounds of water weight and was placed on even higher dose of Lasix. By Monday, I, I was struggling to even move and decided to go to ER. How could it pass? How could I possibly just go from running miles and playing softball just three weeks prior to not even being able to walk on my feet by myself? I was devastated. On top of my drastically reduced mobility, they discovered my sodium level was critically low and other blood levels were too high. My overall kidney function had decreased. Uh, as you could see, her labs or sodium is 119, K was 5.1, uh, Bica was okay, B150, creatinine 1.6. Prior to that, her creatinine was normal, uh, like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 0 0.6 on, on some occasions. EGFR was 36, glucose was 127, hemoglobin 14, normal liver function test. Her serum albumin 2.2, protein 4.9, her urine protein to creatinine ratio that day was 1.88. And this time I did the 24 hour urine protein collection, 1.34. This was done in the hospital when she had this acute renal failure. Urine sodium was less than five and you can see her lipid panel. It is abnormal. It was actually then, so all this course happened before we were involved. She was seen by a nephrologist uh, outside in a different hospital. That's why I don't have the exact biopsy report. It's probably scanned somewhere. Uh, she came to our hospital with this acute renal failure. So she, you can see her creatinine trend. Uh, these two red dotted lines are normal. This is when we saw her in the hospital. She, she actually peaked around 1.7-ish and then came down while she was in the hospital. So this is, as you could see, that July 1, 2016 time. So um, uh, and then this just happened before that. So she wrote on June 26 that I was admitted immediately and spent next five days there. I had 15 blood draws, 14 heparin shots in my belly, three extra pounds of water pumped into my body to stabilize my levels. So you can all imagine that this is how we treated her acute renal failure. And I looked and smelled like a homeless drug addict, addict from the uh, the <laughs> grease in my hair to the numerous needle mark running up and down my arms. Uh, when the doctor decided to send me home, I think she would describe that how happy I wa she was uh, by some outpatient monitoring. And I saw her at that time one day before her discharge. I decided to discharge her with outpatient monitoring and then see her in the clinic. She was very happy um, because she did not, she has four children and she did not arrange any childcare and it was very difficult for her to stay in the hospital any longer. Okay, continued. So she wrote that kidney disease can be scary, but it's only just met me. It has no idea who it's dealing with and I am bigger than this stupid disease. Yes, I may have my moments when I see my family head out the door to swim without me. And when I can't walk up the steps without stopping or, uh, for breaks, but those are just that moments. They won't last forever. So she's very hopeful 
yet she's very scared and afraid. I'm not going to stop living. I'm not going to spend my days hiding in my house and I'm not going to let this disease define me. Let people stare at my new 50 pound of junk in the trunk. Let, let them wonder. And she wrote that my goal is to be well enough to play in the mom's make a wish softball tournament and same golf tournament at the end of July. If I can do that, I know I have won. So um, she was keeping her uh, diary of all the, you know, uh, food intake and salt intake very well and wrote that don't think about what can happen in a month. Don't think about what can happen in a year. Focus on the 24 hours in front of you and do what you can to get closer to where you want to be. She, she further, you know, had this quote, you have to fight through some bad days to earn the best days of your life. Um, July 11, quickly, you know, this was all June, July, next stop remission. Uh, well, it's been about two weeks since my last update and a lot has changed. Um, I think she came to the office. She thought that she's losing weight, but in fact, when she walked in the office, her weight was up. Uh, my doctor was disappointed to see my lack of progress and looked rather defeated when discussing my probable diagnosis. He upped my steroids even higher to match like one milligram per kilogram and added some new medications and sent me on my way. By the end of 45 minute appointment, I could barely walk to the lab to get my blood draws and felt like curling up in the middle of sidewalk and crying like a baby. Um, so these were her uh, legs before and th this is the after picture which she posted, you know, I, and, I, and I will tell you how she described her remission. So she continues on that July 11 blog that I willed myself to sleep, but sleep did not had. Instead, I was up every five minutes, uh, pissing due to medication changes. By the next morning, I was down eight pounds and my smile returned. From that day on, each night brought more and more urination and each morning brought less weight and more optimism. In five days, I lost 56 pounds and was back to my fighting weight. I felt like a million bucks and cried again, but this time, there were tears of complete happiness and gratitude. I was winning. I am alive and I am mobile and I am defeating FSTS. So this was her journey in that July to uh, probably for the next six months, maybe a little bit more. So you could see that her creatinine went up during that episode of acute renal failure, came down, remained stable. Uh, as we treated her, her albumin, which was like less than 2.5, started to come up very quickly. So by August 31, her um, albumin hit almost you know, 3.5 and then it remained within the normal limits. She, she hit four. And you can see that corresponding decline in the protein urea rather quickly. Uh, and urine protein to creatinine ratio dropped from 1.8 gram. This is what we have in our system. She probably had the higher protein urea before that and it came down. So this was a pretty uh, straightforward story to, to, to view. So. She wrote uh, a few months later, keep on keeping on. Well, I have officially been in remission three months. My blood work continues to be good and my doctor have slowly started to taper me off my steroids. So the, now she describes her problem with the steroids. Currently, I have a love and hate relationship with prednisone. I love it because it's helping me to keep my FSGS at bay, but I hate it because of, it makes me feel like completely different person. My muscles, Muscle coordination is awful these days. My arms and hands shake like hell at times. My daily headaches have returned. And occasionally, I have a hard time getting my muscles to perform tasks that used to be so natural to me, like running and throwing a softball. I hate my mind tells my body to do something, and my body just does not want to listen. In the big picture, this isn't a big deal. But for me, I am lost without this active, competitive part of me. Overall, I'm in a good place on most days. I consider that win. All right, so some of the discussion points, I think I, as I mentioned, the ARF uh, with nephrotic syndrome. Uh, I think when I remember Arsalan mentioned that this is something we, they deal with all the time. 
um, in a SARCA, how to manage that when it's really bad and roll off anticoagulation. So I think we covered anticoagulation, but I have, I think, this, this slide from the last time. So uh, what are the reasons for AKI associated with nephrotic syndromes? It's commonly seen more often in minimal change disease than other types of nephrotic syndrome, but it has been seen um, you know, otherwise as well. Uh, volume, either over diuresis, patient um, is developed vomiting diarrhea, or patient is very prerenal. Could be ATN from volume and sepsis related events. And if those patients need dialysis, that duration for dialysis may be a few weeks. I remember a patient of minimal change disease who was on dialysis for six months before he recovered. Uh, toxic exposures in the part of the you know, course of the patient, contrast, antibiotics, sensates. Uh, altered hemodynamics. So it's not only the uh, de decrease, you know, effective arterial volume overall, but also there is um, change. There are changes in the hydraulic permeability and oncotic pressure inside the glomerulus, which actually leads to reduction in GFR by another 30%. On top of that, if there is intrarenal interstitial edema, I think this contributes and say. ACE inhibitors, CNI, these are the added insert to the injury. You also see AI, and A, you can see AIN from diuretics or and or antibiotics, renal vein thrombosis. We should never be, you know, we should always uh, remember that. Or transformation of underlying GN, for example, crescentic GN, RPGN. Um, some patients with aggressive disease as a part of their original disease, like collapsing FSCS is very aggressive and cast nephropathy. So these are some of the AKI associated with nephrotic syndromes. My question, I will ask you if you can just type a chat in your chat box, what do you see as the most common reason for acute renal failure associated with nephrotic syndrome in your practice? Can we have a response on that? I will stop here, give maybe um, a few seconds. A, then B. Ahad wrote A. Okay, so volume is winning. Um, anybody else? So A is so far, um, okay. So C, so we have one C, but predominantly this is A, okay? So it looks like that volume depletion. Um, I, I think the volume depletion in the middle of nephrotic syndrome is one of the um, etiology, but there is a little bit more than just the volume depletion. So this is the effective arterial volume. I think the re altered renal hemodynamics inside the glomerulus, so they also play a role. Um, anybody wants to comment on this? Because uh, again, like I think there, there are different views on this as well, and there are some theories. Um, anybody wants to say something? Yeah, can I say something? Sure. Okay, so absolutely, this happens in the membranous patient also, and uh, minimum change also. Their oncotic pressure is very low, and that causes effective intervascular depletion. But again, this patient was given IV fluid, right? Uh, you think that's a good approach? She was a very, uh, she has edema and NSARC almost. Yep, so, so I mean, like what should we do? I think this is, this is a question. So when she came in with acute renal failure, she was given three liters of IV fluids uh, in the emergency room before they even called uh, the, the nephrologist and she was super swollen. She just could not, you know, her hands, her eyes, her legs, it was, they were full of fluid. The, so they didn't give her albumin, they gave her IV fluids, uh, like regular IV fluids. So, um, what, so your question was, is that a good approach? Yes, that's my question. I mean, uh, would you give that, uh, I, prob I will not give IV fluid uh, saline to this patient. Uh, Neither albumin, I mean, it's not indicated. Obviously, the treatment is uh, basically steroids to decrease her, you know, the inflammation. Uh, but giving IV fluid can make her like, more venous congestion and so can actually, uh, I mean, decrease her GFR, in my opinion, mm -hmm. experience. Right. Dr. Masood, I will slightly differ in this point regarding the effective arterial blood volume. 
and the AKI, which is more like a pre-renal component in this pig. Steroids in FSGS will take a little while to work. It's a stubborn disease. So in this situation, which Omar is trying to stress, whereas there's an effective arterial blood volume and you have a rise in creatinine and it's an AKI-like situation, giving a bit of fluids or albumin will not harm this patient. Yeah, that's why we discuss. I mean, uh, it's opinion, but again, uh, uh, in my opinion, it causes. Uh, we have seen this cause more venous congestion, renal venous congestion, and actually can increase the uh, creatinine. In this case, it's a bit different. Respond. I mean, she her creatinine went down, and sometimes when you give fluid, creatinine also gets diluted. It doesn't mean that GFR improves when you creatinine get diluted. Similarly, as patient's sodium went down because of hypervolemia, creatinine can also go down. So yeah, the venous congestion, which you are mentioning, the back pressure, that will happen in a cardiorenal uh, setting when your RV pressure will go up. Then there will be a back pressure and the pressure within the Bowman's capsule will increase. In that condition, your point is absolutely well taken that the main cause of the uh, filtration will be the back pressure and the pressure increase in the Bowman's capsule. But that will be a setting of a cardiorenal syndrome and increase RV pressure. So if I if I if you allow me and I can continue, uh, I think the so at that time it, like when I presented the case we were dealing with somebody with NSARCA and acute renal failure. So we gave her some break on diuretics for a day and two. She already got the IV fluids. So so her once her creatinine started to inch down, we resumed the diuretics at a lower dose. I think when the nephrology team was involved, they gave her albumin and diuretics together. So I think the, the next question is, how do you manage this severe NSARCOV in, this, in the middle of severe nephrosis as well? So I tell my patients that dietary sodium restriction is actually more important than, dietary, than the water restriction itself. A lot of patients, uh, once you put them on water restriction, and even in hyponatremia, they start using Gatorade. So uh, some of the patient who wants to increase their protein intake, they are drinking the chicken corn soup, which has a lot of salt with it. So to me, salt is the magnet that draws a lot of water and it, that starts like this perpetual cycle of this NSARCA. So really the salt restriction to me is the, is the number one. Uh, these patients, when they are in the middle of this nephro nephrosis and uh, uh, you know really bad nephrotic syndrome, they have diuretic resistance from mul multitude of causes, poor absorption from the gut due to gut edema. So IV diuretics help. Albumin uh, is very low. Lasix or those loop diuretics, they are highly protein bound. So in the blood, the albumin is low and there is a lot of albumin inside the tubule where these uh, uh, diuretics have to act. So, so basically, this kind of there is less Lasix or less uh, ferrosamide that sticks to albumin in the serum, and there is a lot of affinity inside the tubular lumen, which is the site of action, and that's why I think sometimes you see a delayed or less response, uh, and that that leads for higher or more frequent dose. Uh, and then sometimes you have to kind of add a thiazide or other kind of diuretics just to try a different segment on the, on the tubule. The question of albumin use with diuretics, again, I think uh, this is data-free zone, um, but this has been recommended and suggested by some and others, uh, you, you know, I think in my personal use, and I'm sure you have tried that too, uh, this helps for first time or first few days for these patients who are in very you know, difficult uh, situation. The, the other question is, what should be the timing of ACE inhibitor and ARB? If, can we use this in the middle of acute renal failure uh, or not? So uh, what's the uh, jury, jury's out for the timing of ACE inhibitor? What's the practice and what, how, how do you handle that? Do you start it when somebody has acute renal failure? Do you start it uh, along with the steroids? Do you start it with, um, you know, at what point in the middle of renal failure you, you attempt that? May I answer this? 
Sure. Uh, for ACE inhibitors, we usually, uh, uh, with acute rise in creatinine, we tr try to keep it on a hold, unless if the patient's blood pressure is very high. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, uh, then we wouldn't know clearly that uh, if the creatinine is not severe disease. So that's usually our practice. If the blood pressure is high, then we may consider it. Otherwise, we not. Yeah. So I think I, I, unless you know, for example, for this patient, when we gave her a break on ACE inhibitor for day and two day or two, when the creatinine started to improve, I actually started her on ACE inhibitor back, and her creatinine then continued to improve. So again, salt restriction is more than water restriction. Uh, is more important than water restriction. So. Uh, we discussed the role of anticoagulation last time. I will summarize in maybe 30, 40 seconds. Farooq, uh, can I comment one thing? Please. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck with that uh, fluid thing on this patient. Uh, it's okay to have a discussion because we're all educated and nobody's wrong. We're just a matter of different mm -hmm. opinion. So this patient had low sodium also, like 119. Yes. And the sodium was low. What do you think? Sodium was low because the patient was volume overloaded, right? Patient was like, you know, patient was in severe nephrosis and severe NSRK. So hyponatremia with urine sodium less than five. Yeah. So she had hyponatremia because patient was volume overloaded and she was diluted. So in this case, I mean, the concept of uh, the latest concept of giving fluid is totally changed. I mean, I do not worry too much about creatinine high. That's not my goal is to bring the creatinine down. 1.6 doesn't bother me. I need to bring the patient's overall condition down. So in this case, uh, if you give fluid with the low oncotic pressure, it's going to end up in interstitium and it will uh, increase the uh, edema in the tubules also. Mm -hmm. Just like to say that, I mean, this, uh, I, in my personal opinion, I could be wrong, but... Uh, I, I, I think the patient actually described that even. She, she didn't like that she was given three liters of fluid. Mm -hmm. um, very so smart patient. She knows what's going on. sodium is less about. than five. This means that patient, kidneys are sensing the, like, like low effective circulating volume. If the serum sodium is less than 120, this means there is a lot of water excess. So there is, this patient is like, you know, that balance is, is up. The ADH is um, kind of playing its role as well. So, so there was a combination of volume, volume depletion, effective arterial circulation, volume depletion, and water excess causing all these abnormalities. And this happened while the diuretic dose in the outpatient was increased from 43 times a day to 83 times a day. And that's when she was very hypotensive. She was also, um, uh, uh, I mean, and I show you her uh, initial labs. Dr. Ifan, you want to say something? Yeah, so I'll just make a couple of points here. The first thing is we have to kind of visualize what's going on with this patient. So she's terribly third spaced. And so the art of diuresis in these patients is to balance the, the, the rate at which you're mobilizing fluid from the intravascular compartment using diuretics with the rate of refill from the interstitium. So what happened in this particular patient's case is that they were looking at the peripheral edema. They were frustrated by the fact that the peripheral edema was not getting better and they increased her diuretics to a point where they crashed her intravascular compartment. So she's still total body volume overloaded, but she's intravascularly very dry. So as Umar pointed out, um, <clears throat> the kidney is actually sensing this correctly. Um, so she's intravascularly depleted. Uh, once you're intravascularly depleted, you actually, uh, through baroreceptors, uh, sense the hypovolemia and hypovolemia is a much stronger stimulus of ADH release than is osmolality change. So that's why you have a very high uh, ADH state, which is pushing out all the, all the water from the tubules back into the circulation. And you have a very high renin, angiotensin, aldosterone drive, which is pulling out all the sodium from the tubules into the circulation because the body is trying to conserve this. And that also is your, your indicator that if in this particular patient, you started an ACE or an ARB, you'll probably crash this patient because she's actually maintaining whatever GFR she has on a very high 
uh, renin angiotensin drive. But um, so should we give her fluid or not um, is a very tricky question. So we can actually make the numbers look better like Dr. Avance is saying by giving her fluid. But what really needs to happen is we need to hold her diuretics and give it time to re-equilibrate. And she will backfill from her own tissues and start improving her GFR again. Albumin is always a very interesting question in these patients. And the paradigm we lift from management of cirrhotics. There's one big difference between cirrhotics and people who've got significant nephrosis, and that is that the kidneys are not leaking protein. So I have used albumin with diuretics in these patients when they get very refractory, but you have to realize that you're actually wasting a very, very expensive urine specimen. They're actually dumping half of that albumin into the urine pretty quickly because they're so frankly nephrotic. Um, so in the olden times, uh, we were taught, we used to think about this um, bioavailability thing because all the diuretics that actually get into the business end of the tubule have to go through the organic anion transporter in the proximal convoluted tubule. And that requires the albumin molecule to carry it to the OAT. Otherwise, they don't get through into where they need to be. But once they're in the tubule, Umar is absolutely right that when you've got nephrotic syndrome, half of that diuretic is actually uh, complex with the albumin and is not bioavailable to the sodium potassium two chloride channel. Um, so it is always a little bit of an art here to figure out what dose of diuretic would be good for these patients. And sometimes we just get it wrong and they crash. And, uh, you know, I have used albumin in those circumstances when it is very severe, but mostly what I've done is hold off on the, on the diuretics and give them time and they eventually start recuperating. So in this particular patient, when we gave them three liters of saline, um, or 500 milli equivalents odd of um, sodium, that would have immediately third spaced into the tissues and pulled more fluid into the tissues. So two days later, she would say, my edema is worse. Um, so it's a short term gain, but there's a lot of pain involved with that. So I'll, 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 I'll stop here and I'll let Omar continue. No, I think this is, this is, this is wonderful. This is a great discussion again. I think uh, which day of the, of the week or which day of the hospitalization we, we were seeing her. So once, uh, Towards the end of her hospitalization, I, when I resumed the diuretics, I, I used Q6 hours because considering the half-life of the drug, because you need more frequent dosage. And I, I found that, you know, if you use even lower dose, once, once they start to respond in these patients, you have to use it at least Q12 or Q8 hours to make sure that um, it's constantly working. I think using it just once a day uh, never did that trick for me. And, and I think it's kind of pull and push. You, you use something, uh, if you're over, then you back off. Sometimes asking patient to take, take some rest, keep the legs elevated, you know, uh, that actually helps mm -hmm. to remobilize the fluids from the legs back into the, some compartments so the kidneys can, you know, get rid of it. Well, Omar, there's a question on chat. Um, uh, let me see, this is by Dr. Mufti. And they ask any role of mannitol in, in a resource limited setting. So instead of albumin, if mannitol would be useful, what are your views on that? Um, you know, the mannitol, we, I have not used this for this uh, uh, particular situation and, not, and haven't heard that, um, you know, never felt the need to use it. Even we're not, you know, previously we used to use mannitol to prevent dialysis disequilibrium. We're not actually using that either. So uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to this. Uh, anybody else wants to take the, um, the question for me? Yeah, this is a vast pursuit. Uh, no study has shown that any benefit of mannitol using mannitol. So I have not used mannitol ever in this situation. So the only place where mannitol is used routinely is in the neurosurgical departments. The only problem with mannitol is that sometimes it works too well. And if you've got 
uh, loss of GFR because of forward flow and you push a lot of uh, mannitol in there, you'll have filtration failure. So in a pinch, it may work if you're using it in a low enough dose, but I would be a little cautious in using mannitol in these patients. But, um, you know, we don't have any um, studies uh, looking at mannitol in nephrotic syndrome, I don't think. Uh, but we've all used it uh, in certain circumstances, uh, but mostly in in the U.S., the only place you will see mannitol being used now is in the neurosurgical department. And I work in a neurosurgery ICU, and also over there, very rarely we use mannitol. We use a 3% or 5% saline in that case to decrease the cerebral edema. Okay. So moving on um, to my patient, we discussed the role of anticoagulation last time. I think three factors I mentioned, you look for risk for, for bleeding. What is their albumin in the blood? Less than two, two to three and more than three. And if this is membranous versus others in pregnancy, the options are baby aspirin, uh, low molecular weight heparin, warfarin. And we discussed, I think last time about the uh, direct oral anticoagulants quickly. If this is membranous and patient has low risk of bleeding. Al any, once the albumin is less than three, there is a recommendation, again, recommendation or suggestion to use the um, uh, anticoagulation. If this are, there are other causes and low risk of bleeding, then you use anticoagulation if albumin is less than two. I think with membranous, if the bleeding risk is intermediate, then you have to kind of, you know, still be less conservative with membranous. And so I think- Can you point out how they're calculating this low or intermediate risk of bleeding? I think they, you can use, um, um, uh, again, I believe this, this was taken, I mean, I just reproduced from the up-to-date. I think they, they used the same, there was a, uh, uh, like a calculator, for example, when you use to risk uh, for the AFib, if you want to start somebody on anticoagulation, you, you, uh, uh, there was a, uh, there's a calculator. I think I can share the link. GN tools, Omar, GN tools. Okay. Uh, yeah, that calculates the uh, bleeding risk, that calculates the, your thrombotic risk, and you desire, do you have a benefit to risk ratio? And then you decide about the anticoagulation. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I think in pregnancy, the concept is that you are, you know, more liberal with anticoagulation. Duration, we discussed either until you achieve remission or the duration of nephrosis or until albumin is more than three. Uh, I, I think we discussed aspirin. If uh, somebody is, um, you know, albumin is above three. I think some, some authors use aspirin in every nephrotic syndrome patient regardless. And the direct oral anticoagulation, uh, th these drugs, they will be used more and more, I, I can imagine, moving forward, although the, the experience is still kind of on the low side. So um, I think the question, we, we kind of had a detailed discussion about this last week as well, that whether you use the anticoagulation routinely or not, maybe if I can go keep presenting the case because I know I'm already above my allocated time. So the story continues. And, and this was the, the first diagnosis and remission in 2016. There was a relapse in 2018 treated with steroids with quick response within three weeks or so and um, patient completed a treatment and patient is not very happy with steroids and in very recently you know 2020 she relapsed again and uh, uh, let's see what she has to say so these are the labs second relapse um, basically this is the third episode but second relapse so creatinine, as you could see, this is August, this is July. So creatinine has been between 0.6 and 0.8. Her glucose uh, de novo has been high, and these are non-fasting labs. Other labs look pretty good. You can see in the graph that her serum albumin actually dropped after her urine protein went up. So her urine protein went up from like really undetectable all the way above four grams. And then you see that her serum albumin drops. You can see that uh, this is a 24 hour protein. I, I did that collection, it was 3.9 grams. Whereas on the ratio, she was December 2019.07, July, she was 24.1 uh, and she had 
very foamy and frothy urine. So, so this was kind of confirmed and uh, uh, this is now, she wrote, a patient wrote a letter to her own kidneys. Uh, this is in her blog. She wrote, dear kidneys, wake up, wake up. You're sleeping on the job again. You're still years away from retirement. So please stop being lazy. I would hate to have to put daily support in place to help you do your job. And I definitely don't want to ever have to replace you. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, she, she just said that I'm begging you to get your act together. Okay. So, um, then I think she sent me a, a note that let's discuss the treatment. So the patient was doing a lot of reading herself and she wants to try rituximab infusions, okay? So her pros were, and this is again a patient, what patient is sending me the letter. Research shows great response and remission rate in young FSCS patients who are, are repeat relapsers and have responded to prednisone. So basically her own case. Cheaper long-term than immunosuppressant treatment, less side effects and other treatment options, best shot at long-term remission for frequent relapses. Her cons, hard to get approved by the insurance. Uh, I remember a patient of mine got like a you know, pretty heavy bill and I had to do peer-to-peer -peer review. Uh, she also said that this is in the middle of COVID. So I just want a treatment that's not going to deplete my immune system long-term, especially in today's current climate. And that won't hit me with a slew of side effects that make me feel worse than the actual disease. So question, I think, uh, what would you do next? So she got first treatment with prednisone, second treatment with prednisone two years ago. Now this is her another relapse. Uh, what would you do? Options? Anybody wants to, to say something? Uh, I would wait for other people to respond. I have some comments, but I'll wait for other people to comment. I think I would uh, give a trial of cyclosporin in here because it's a tip lesion mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, which uh, is known to have a very good response of, uh, with cyclosporin. Good. So, or a, like your uh, answer. Okay. Patient is asking for a rituximab, and so, but I think I like your okay. answer. Can I just? Uh, since you know it is uh, responding to steroids, and if you take the uh, the case reports and literature about uh, minimal chain disease responding to rituximab, so I think there is a case to uh, uh, give rituximab also. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Dr. Tari. I, I appreciate your uh, response. On the chat channel, Dr. Mufti and Dr. Azmat both feel that cyclosporin uh, would be a good option here. So it looks like that we have some votes for CNI. We have some votes for rituximab. I think both are like, you know, what, what about CELSEP? Does CELSEP have uh, like, like any role in, in this disease state? Okay. Dr. Lenwala is, is shaking his head. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, in, in uh, FSG is, uh, in, in children especially, it, it works only if it's given uh with the uh, with steroids with long-term steroids so okay. you usually make them steroid dependent and as soon as you want to taper them off uh it's just the uh, uh, you know um they go back having the same number of relapses so in my experience i don't think that mmf alone can stop uh, these frequent relapses or steroid dependency uh, i i appreciate anybody else wants to say because I promise patient that I will be discussing this with all of you. And I think she wrote that in her blog too. Yeah. I mean, I have been, you know, seeing patients. All right. Um, okay. Go ahead, please. I'll... Uh, uh, first of all, I must apologize because I tried to raise hand size, but uh, I think that wasn't the case. The old school way of unmuting yourself and trying to speak is the a real way to do yeah i I can't, so, I, can't the, I can't see the hands maybe i don't have the right thing open let me see if i can open that up but please go ahead dr Aurangzeb. all right maybe maybe that was the case so i was waiting because uh, dr west just uh, set the rules a while ago <clears throat> so the thing is i have a cognitive bias in favor of rituximab so i think i should not be talking about that and we'll be discussing more about rituximab when we discuss discuss about the condition in pakistan 
I was just curious about that uh, IV fluid thing that uh, was the topic of the discussion a while ago. So what is the percentage of fluid that will remain intravascular for a patient of serum albumin of two? And just for reference, uh, if we can uh, say what is the percentage of crystallite fluid remaining intravascular in a normal albumin patient? Uh, Dr. Ifan, probably the mic is not uh, open. Now I was I was waiting for uh, for Umar to feel the question. So Umar, no, please. I I think I, I I there was interruption, so I couldn't hear. Yeah, any... so, so the question, Doctor Aurangzeb no. is asking is uh, in a person with a an albumin of four, compared to a person with an albumin of two, uh, what what percentage of normal saline administered stays intravascular? I, I think this this is a wonderful question. So for I know for the dextrose there is a, there is only eighty seven cc's that stays intravascular if you have a liter of dext D five water. So for saline when we did the calculation last time, I mean not not everything stays intravascular. Was it like two fifty cc or something? But I I mean I just have to do the calculation again two third one third and then um, so you probably have the answer uh, or is it almost two. But for a hypoalbumic patient. Uh, mm -hmm. Up to my understanding was it must be close to half of that. And so uh, if we are giving one liter, so probably what is going to stay intervascularly is going to be 125 ml. Mm -hmm. And we are gifting almost uh, 900 to the interstitial fluid. Mm -hmm. So probably for me, uh, I don't think I have gone through the data for that, but I feel a little worried that I may worsen the third spacing in that case. Yeah. So usually so what, it, what we do okay. are in my department. Yeah? So you just we just added insult to the injury. So patient is already third space. We are just kind of... No, uh, you know. That's not the case. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, please don't say that. I, I'm just trying to understand the proper... Uh, uh, the thought process that went behind it. Probably you were seeing the patient and you were the better judge. Probably the patient was having an overdiuresis issue. I'm not sure. So in that case, patient does need an IV fluid. But for general understanding, if the patient is having generalized NSARCA and presenting an emergency and the diagnosis is intravascular volume depletion, probably holding on to the uh, diuretics uh, does the business and the patient gets fine in a couple of days. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think oh, yeah. I you're right. And again, the, the oh, discussion was uh, by the ER physician, not by us. I mean, I, I think uh, if, yeah, I, if I, think I were to any, yeah. to that situation, Bolin. you know, I, I like, I believe in giving patients bolus. I, I mean, I don't believe in giving, if you want to restore the circulation and restore the hypotension, give them a bolus of some sort of a fluid, your fluid choice and the amount of fluid. I mean, if, if they, if I were the, I mean, they called me, I would give maybe a five, 500 cc of 5% albumin, give her break on, you know, diuretics for two, three days, let the creatinine stabilize and then resume my diuretics at, a, at rather a lower dose. But the patient was hypotensive. She was dizzy. She was kind of, you know, how when they present to the ER, um, they, ED, the ER physician, you know, this is the kind of, you know, again, I think we discussed in the sepsis talk that by the time we are with these sepsis bundles, you know, with anytime they see hypertension, these things, they just kind of pour the fluids. So, but I agree. I think if I would have been called, you know, I would just give like a trial of 5% albumin, just give a break on diuretics for a day or two, let the jets cool off, and then, you know, resume my diuretics. Dr. Tai, if you want to say something, you're... And that's Yes, I just right. want to you know, uh, just uh, uh, narrate one uh, uh, you know, occasion when I was just uh, starting my fellowship. And uh, I was called early in the morning. The radiologist, uh, one of the radiologist consultant's wife came in. And she had nephrotic syndrome. She was like fully loaded with fluid, just like the same case as you were saying. And the albumin was on the low side. I just went in and told them, okay, restrict the fluid, restrict the salt and everything. And then, uh, you know, she was thirsty because she was intravascularly depleted, although she was kind of maintaining her uh, blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So my attending, Dr. Jose Arudai, just came in 
and he said uh, he talked to them and they told uh, about this thing and he said oh no 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 just drink fluid whatever you want don't worry about it and uh, we'll take care of it so i think that was uh, the time that i realized that if the patient is intravascularly depleted as dr irfan was saying you have to make sure you know the intake output from the body and from the intravascular space and the third space so it is an art of managing your diuretics the oral fluid intake or maybe an albumin infusion sometimes and there is no right or wrong answer right away so you have to see your patient and just give them the albumin if they require albumin it's very low or uh, you can give just as you said you know a little bit of bolus of fluid if you want just to improve their blood pressure if they are very hypotensive maybe use some inotropics along with that so it's not like one thing that you can fit all so you'll have to tailor your medication with precision for your patient no i fully agree i think i think this you summarize very well and then how patient described when she lost 56 pounds at home you know that was it's actually that day i, I like it, it's just because she went into remission and her kidneys were picking up on the slack not that you know diuretics or anything else was you know when she lost like a lot of fluid in one uh, in one week this was because she she just achieved remission so so these are biological diseases things are, are dynamic maybe we keep trying 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 with diuretics and everything they are resistant and all of a sudden the disease is just started to respond to steroids and then patient uh, you know the body kind of took care of the volume status itself so i think coming back to this question that patient uh, now asked me this is my you know third time i have it i don't want to you know it's can i can give my opinion because i think i'm officially host that's why i don't have the option of raising hand otherwise i would obviously raise my hand so, so can i give please. us some my comments go ahead avas please okay so i mean over the years uh, i have seen A lot of patients with FSGS, mainly primary, who needs, uh, you know, immunosuppressant medications. So, I mean, evidence-based medicine we try to practice. So, in that case, this patient, I would go for my first choice would be uh, cyclosporine, and of course, we have used uh, cell-self, particularly those patients who have a little bit increased creatinine, uh, because in that case, cyclosporine can cause, you know, uh, on the nephrotoxicity. at the same time that's two medication we have used more like uh, cyclosporine on uh, steroid resistant cases i have not used uh, rituxan for this patient although the data is very limited on this and also actually i was thinking about using actor in future because that is also available now in sub q uh, prep, prep so these are few options uh, uh, we have cyclosporine celsept a reduction also but very limited data and also the acth uh, actor so uh, i i i think uh, thank you this is uh, this is good so i will continue on i think i have two or three more slides so patient said that in her letter to the kidneys my doctor thinks this will likely be life um Uh, periods of good then periods of bad i'm trying a new treatment this time around it's an anti rejection drug given to patients after transplant called tecrolimus fingers crossed this works so what i did that i think um, when like similar to what i was supposed to discuss with all of you i actually discussed with my my other colleagues in the division as well and we discussed the patient wants to do rituximab what should we do and i think this this thought was given to us like you know this is this may keep coming back again and again rituximab uh, just consider it as, as a big gun or maybe your last resort option so keep your those big guns in the back pocket for later just tell patient that maybe you know you can try something different than steroids and and we did uh, move to cni so this was the uh, houses uh, opinion as well and i think this matches with what you just uh, summarize so we i opted to use rituxim uh, sorry tecrolimus without any steroids um so the so she patient wrote that my doctor is going to be a part of an international research team which all of you are and is planning on presenting my case to them i'm hopeful to the right treatment can be found to help me keep my own kidneys kicking for many many more years 
All right, so we gave her, and just like you know, you can see that this you, this is a graph for tacrolimus level. I think this reached to four. You can see that her albumin, which was going down, started to come up, and then her urine protein to creatinine ratio started to go down from above four all the way, 0.64 within three weeks or so. So patient again achieved a successful remission. Um, the, she continues that I know this isn't the end of the world and that many people are fighting much tougher battles, but it still kicks me, kicks up my anxiety a lot. Not because I may eventually need dialysis or a new bean, which means new kidney, but because I never want my kids to see me as a sick mom. I don't want to miss a practice, a game, a parent teacher conference a princess dance party, a driveway basketball game, or a 27 minute recap of a five minute fortnight battle. I simply just want to be mom. May I? May I? Dr. Lenwala, please go ahead. Yes, I, I, I'm seeing, uh, we're fortunate that Dr. Ejaz is also in our group. Uh, Dr. Ejaz is our senior professor at SIUT and uh, I think uh, he has at least twice or more than twice experienced than me dealing with these nephrotic syndrome. Sir, what is your opinion in these, these cases uh, about the UT? Dr. Ajaz, so you'll have to unmute your, yourself. Just hit the unmute button on the left hand corner of your screen. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I was because I'm I'm not very familiar with the with this uh, mode of uh, communication. So I was listening with interest what so you were question, discussing and uh, yes. So the question ahead, on the Ali. forum is that yes, the question on the forum is uh, first about the anticoagulation. Uh, here on this forum, uh, everyone is of an opinion of using anticoagulation more frequently and the. Uh, uh, usual practice guidelines from KDGO, uh, when we were discussing, you said that we don't follow this because of our limitations. So can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, I mean, our peculiar problem is at SIUD, we see half or 60% of the patient coming from villages. And it is very difficult to maintain anticoagulation or and follow up anticoagulation people who are living in remote villages. The only other preparation which is available in Pakistan is river oxaban and it is slightly costly for our population. I agree with the, all the participants that patient with membranous nephropathy should be put on anticoagulation if the serum albumin is less than two. I'm not sure whether all the patients with serum albumin between two and three should go on anticoagulation, especially in our setting when where the monitoring is a problem. Uh, I have not seen much spontaneous thromboembolic event in patients with uh, focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. 
So we don't usually anticoagulate patients with FSGS even if the serum albumin is less than two, although this is again a debatable issue among the academic center. The last thing I was uh, listening with interest, the last case, uh, the female who has received two courses of prednisolone and on both occasions she went into remission and now third time she is reluctant to undergo prednisolone therapy because of side effects she had experienced in the past. I, uh, I agree that uh, as far as I am concerned, I would go for calcineurin inhibitor, either cyclosporine or tacrolimus. There is very little data to support that rituximab will induce long-term remission in such patient. I haven't, I haven't seen any, any study to, uh, large study to support the use of rituximab. The last thing which uh, I was just wondering that from pediatric literature. There was a case in the past that patients who are frequently relapsing, although in this case she is not, of giving prednisolone and cyclophosphamide once, and they may go into long-lasting remission. I have not seen that in adult population. I have used prednisolone with, with cyclophosphamide in patients who are steroid responsive and are relapsing frequently. But uh, here I have not seen much lasting remission if you combine prednisolone and cyclophosphamide in steroid responsive patients. So my personal view that I agree with most participants that it, should, it would be either cyclosporin or tacrolimus in this particular case. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajaz, for those uh, remarks. And I think this, that's all very pertinent. In the adult population, there is data out of um, Chicago. Uh, Dr. Steve Corbett has published a short dose cyclophosphamide in frequently relapsing FSGS. So two month course of um, uh, cyclophosphamide and that works for quite a, a lot of people. Um, so there's some data to support what you've suggested that what you've used in, in the pediatric populations. Dr. Lane Wala, you wanted to say something, sir? No, the, exactly the same thing. For children, uh, they have a higher percentage of steroid dependence and uh, we just use cyclophosphamide as a first line drug in steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome and stay in remission for more than five, six years uh, with just one course of cyclophosphamide that we give like two milligram, two to three milligram per kilogram a day over a period of two to three months. And uh, after completing that one cumulative dose of around 168 milligrams per kilogram and um, they, uh, about 77% of them achieved sustained remission. So we Mark, have very I good. Say? Yes, please. Can you finish? So I'm looking yeah, at the two question, uh, Rose. Uh, one is that uh, why not try MFF before uh, rituxin? I totally agree. I mean, rituxin, we still have to wait more trials or more study to come out with the effect of rituxin. And also the question is, patient with increased creatinine, uh, uh, is this CNI still good to give? So that's what uh, we have been doing uh, based on the uh, data. That patient who has increased creatinine like 2 or high or 1.8 or high, I would rather avoid uh, tacrolimus or cyclosporin, uh, would go with Celsept in that case. And so same thing, if you have to give CNI and uh, female particularly, uh, I would go for tacrolimus because have less uh, cosmetic side effects and also it's a slightly better medication than cyclosporin. Uh, so we should not, in my opinion, not jump up to tacrolimus, although potential is great, but we have to oh follow we have to follow, uh, you know, evidence-based medicine. Cyclosporin and Celsept come preferred over tacrolimus at this point. If I may ask a question, I'd raise the hand. Go ahead, Dr. Arunze, please. 
So I was listening to Dr. Lane Bala. So I was just curious that uh, he was saying that uh, he is using the drugs in cystoid responsive nephrotic syndrome. So we are talking about FSGS. So FSCN is in pediatric population, uh, which is responding to steroids and uh, all that. So it's an immune mediated FSGS. So what's the difference between an immune-mediated FSGS that is uh, present in the pediatric population and then for somebody who is a mom and uh, a thunder clap nephrotic syndrome is presenting at the age of 40? That's one thing. Is it different or these are the same diseases and the second hit is uh, timed at an earlier interval for pediatric population and uh, uh, the detailed uh, phenotypic presentation of nephrotic syndrome in adult population is genetically coded towards uh, third or fourth decade of life. Well, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, like Dr. Irfan had uh, said, uh, uh, had given all the details of the morphology and the evolution of this disease last week, um, FSGS is not a disease. I think it's a manifestation it's just a morphology uh, that we see. And uh, I think our knowledge at its best for all these problems, especially when we bring in all the genetic in, uh, involvement, um, there are so many, um, you see, there is uh, about 154 proteins that have been so far studied in the filtration barrier. And all of them, uh, some of them are also multigenic and uh, the mutations that uh, are usually seen are not 100% that, you know, for that same mutation, everyone would get the similar morphology or similar disease uh, clinically too. Um, so I, I, I don't have a, 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 an exact answer if the pediatric FSGS is any way different. But uh, treatment wise, we have seen that those who are steroid sensitive they do well when you, we give them immune suppression. So I, I, I think that Sir, the one more thing, you are from Karachi. Yes. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Um, so no, I was just going to take a stab at Dr. Dr. Aurangzeb's question. I think um, as disease paradigms, the permeability factor related FSGS is the same disease in adults as well as in children. The difference is the immune system um, is different a little bit in children compared to adults. And you have to kind of look at how these diseases eventually are controlled. And the eventual control of the disease in something that is coming out putatively from the B side of the immune system is generation of B regulatory cells and deletion of clones that are actually going to be generating that protein that is more pliant in children compared to adults. That is why when you see these diseases in children, um, and you know, since the adaptive forms of this disease are not very frequent in children, um, a bigger percentage of the FSGS bucket, bucket in children is the permeability factor related FSGS. And a bigger bucket of that actually responds to immunosuppression because eventually their immune system is able to control it. And so a lot of these kids have FSGS when they are you know, 15 years old or 10 years old or eight years old or five years old, but then they get one or two rounds of steroids and then they are in durable lifelong remission. Um, and that just tells you that their regulatory T and B cells have controlled the disease. That is a little bit more difficult as an adult, but does happen. You have people who develop full-blown full nephrotic syndrome, they're given one or two doses of, you know, two cycles of steroids, and then they go into lifelong remission. There are some that would progress. So the disease is an immune imbalance disease, and it depends on how the body repairs it, itself. You had another question, Dr. Aurangzeb, before I rudely interrupted. Uh, I was just uh, curious about Dr. Lenwala is practicing in Karachi and in Leari, there is a population who is uh, black. Uh, they are physically strong, just like people from Sub-Saharan Africa. So is there any uh, more frequency of collapsing FSCS in those patients? For <laughs> example, I was just thinking, is Apol-1, uh, you can't check Apol-1 in Pakistan, but do you feel like collapsing FSGS is relatively more frequent in those people who are from that uh, phenotype? 
Uh, interesting observation. I am not sure. Uh, we have about 15,000 children with nephrotic syndrome registered with us. Out of them, at the top of my head, I can, I, I would say less than 1% would be from that uh, Liari area, that Afro-American phenotype. There are other members of my team. And uh, if Dr. Ajaz so. could comment on the adult population too, because probably in pediatric population, collapsing FSGS uh, is not that frequent. In the adult population, mostly it is. So I, I just study history to those people that are uh, situated in Leari, they have a background from Africa. So Dr. Ajaz may be able to comment if those are having more uh, frequency of collapsing FSGS or not, because you are mostly concerned with the pediatric population. Uh, yes, I mean the, the the hospital where we practice, Ali and myself, it is it is adjacent to Liari town, so the most of the patient come there. But uh, I have not seen more frequent collapsing FSGS in those adult patients, which are probably from African ancestry. There may be a slightly higher uh, frequency of SLE in this population which which we have observed but uh, the all the ethnic races who come to siut from different part of pakistan we have seen collapsing fsgs in all of them nearly equally so it's it's I, in, in my just observation it's not particularly more common in the in the residents of Leari. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, because we are terribly, terribly behind again, so I'm going to just power through some of the cases that we had. Uh, we've already had a very good discussion on various aspects of FSGS, and some of these things have already been discussed. So I'm gonna just quickly move through the, the various cases that we had. <clears throat> and it is about, um, we are one hour and 20 minutes into the, uh, the talk. So I'm going to maybe stop in about 15, 20 minutes so that friends in Pakistan can have a decent uh, night's sleep. So this is a 37 year old African American male, no significant past medical history, a little obese, um, a little obese from our standards, morbidly obese for the rest of the world. Um, developed acute onset swelling of his feet in October of 2019, mildly elevated blood pressure. He had 22 grams of protein in the urine. Albumin was 1.9, creatinine was 1.5. His serum. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Raga, can you just uh, sort of share your screen, please? Oh, oh, yeah, about no. than that. yeah, screen share, Karne, please. Sorry, no. sorry to interrupt. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Are, are you not able to see my screen? I can. Let's do it again. Oh, now. No, I just I just broke out of it, so I'm going to go back into the share screen mode. There we go. So, so the biopsy, so the kappa lambda ratio was 2.01, uh, which is a little abnormal. Uh, biopsy light microscopy showed 43 globs. None of them were globally, globally sclerotic. Uh, sclerotic four had focal sclerosis. Immunofluorescence was negative and the EM showed diffuse food process effacement. So um, what, were your, what would be your therapeutic op options? We offered the patient steroids. He said, no way, I'm not gonna have steroids. If not steroids, what else can you use for induction? So, you know, we've had this conversation. So in this particular case, we chose to use cyclosporin um, and so this is his initial, so after the, you know, diagnosis, we started cyclosporin around this area. So his proteinuria had come down quite significantly after initiation of um, RAS blockade, but we started him on cyclosporin here. His albumin was around two, um, creatinine was just over one, and his protein over the next several months dropped nicely, but for the past four or five months, he's now stuck at the one gram range. So what would you do at this point? So he's a partial remission, not a complete remission. So he's had 
cyclosporin for almost 10 months now. So what would you like to do at this point? Any ideas, anybody? I mean, I would continue cyclosporin a little longer. I mean, he has pretty good response. I mean, it's not a complete remission, but uh, almost he's there. And sometimes it takes much longer to achieve the complete remission or maybe that's all he will get the remission for. So I, I, I totally agree. That's what we have planned to do. So he's yeah. going to get, and I'm, I'm not averse to watching him on cyclosporin for another four or five months to see which way this turns. But as Aves mentions, he's had a good response. His albumin has gone up, so he probably just needs more time. So in the interest of time, I'll just move along. So the point to make over here is that there is other, there are other regimens apart from um, the traditional one make per kg steroid. So in this particular case, we use cyclosporin as an induction agent and it worked pretty well. Okay, this is one of Dr. Aurangzeb's cases. Uh, so 22 year old Pakistani male, four months history of swelling of the feet and some periorbital puffiness, uh, some frothy urine as well to boot. Uh, biopsy was performed, five out of 21 glomeruli with segmental sclerosis, not much chronic change, immunofluorescence was negative. Obviously this biopsy was done in Pakistan, so no EM is available. How would you treat? So how would people treat this case? Would you give him steroids? Would you give him cyclosporin? Steroid. Yes, steroids. Steroids. Okay, well, Dr. Aurangzeb chose to give him rituximab as de novo agent, and he'll explain what his reasons were. So the patient was given four doses. I think this probably maps out to 375 milligrams per meter square. So he's using the traditional rituximab dosing. He used uh, almost a gram of solumedrol along with that. So 250 milligrams every dose. And the proteinuria, remarkable decline. Um, seven grams when he was starting. And uh, so let me see, I'm kind of getting tripped up on these dates. This is not how we use the date. So uh, he went from, in two weeks, he went from seven grams down to 2.5 grams. And within a month, he was in complete remission. So that's a fairly remarkable response. So views on that, what do you think is going on? Dr. Aurangzeb, could you enlighten us why you chose rituximab and not steroids? Was that patient choice or your decision or how did that come about? So uh, the conventional therapy is uh, offered here. For the last four to five years, since the department is made in Lahore General Hospital, we are using the conventional therapy of steroids in FLPS. Mm -hmm. So uh, about uh, one year back, we got lucky and we uh, got rituximab. And uh, it was all uh, with a long struggle with the gold mine. And it's free for the patients. Since then, we started to do some pilot studies regarding getting the answers that everybody is talking about. There isn't any sufficient data regarding rituximab in FSDS. And typically, as a treatment naive patient, what is the response? So this patient was part of a pilot study in which we tried to give 10 patients of uh, FSDS who were treatment naive rituximab. And it was one of those cases. And this was an informed consent after taking complete consent with the patient and telling that you were part of a study and steroid therapy is the norm and it will be given if you plan not to be a part of it. And that was the result. So any hypotheses on how the rituximab is actually working here? Because the patient drop from seven grams to complete remission within three to four weeks. That's really, really fast. That's minimal change territory. That's not FSGS territory. So uh, what kind of FSG, was this tip lesion uh, or was this an NOS lesion? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, the thing is, I am not really sure. And the reason for I'm not sure is uh, for the last uh, 10 years, I can just remember a few cases in which actually this FSGS was reported something except for uh, NOS type. So FSGS by default in Pakistan, it's NOS type. 
So still now, the, uh, Dr. Madhasar, histo uh, nephro histopathologist, is really helping us out, and the learning curve is really increasing sharply. But still, we are not being reported about the actual subtype of FSGS as we speak. Generally. So, I mean, just for the sake of discussion, you could almost generate a hypothesis that the response is to solumedrol and not to the rituximab. Um, because the house is open for that. This is not the response is really, really fast, but this is a phenomenal response, and it looks like the patient has had a durable response at six months. There is no relapse, and I assume they're they're off of all treatment, correct? So yes, sir. Point. That was part of the plan. We did not keep these patients on ACE and ARBs, and we wanted to see what was the response, and that was also informed to the patient that you're going to be subjected to a new regime and we are going to follow that. Right. This, is, this is certainly a hypothesis generating uh, regimen. So obviously you need to come up with uh, some form of a, um, of a trial setting to test this hypothesis, but this is, this is very good response for this particular patient. All right, so then we have a 40 year old female. This is a case we discussed last time so this is the index case here where this is in 2017. She presented, 48-year-old white female, presented with full-blown nephrotic syndrome. We gave her steroids and she had a very good response over the next four to five months as would be expected. So this is where she came off of therapy slowly. This is 2017 and early 2019, she had a relapse. At that point, she was given another course of steroids and she quieten down again, but within a few months, she broke through again. And this time she refused to take steroids at all. Um, calcium inhibitor was tried for about two or three months here, but uh, there was no response of note. Um, so at that point, what we did was we put her back on steroids. She had a very good response and looking at her frequent relapses, and the fact that she hadn't responded well to cyclosporin, although the, the trial period was short, but looking at her steroid responsiveness, she was given rituximab here. Um, and so far, she is in complete remission since that time. So um, that's kind of what we did for this particularly, uh, particular frequently relapsing case. Um, and so the question is, in this particular situation, if you're going to use rituximab, and again, the data for this is very scant and it's limited to case reports and case series only where there's an inherent publication bias. You only publish stuff that works. So if you've done four patients and three of them didn't work, but the fourth one worked, you're likely to present the fourth one into the literature and it's gonna get accepted as an abstract or as a case report. So you have to kind of keep all of that. So large uh, pinch of salt with this. But at this point, once people go into response with rituximab, should we wait for a relapse or should we keep dosing rituximab for a few years like we do in NCA associated vasculitis to maintain uh, remission? What are the group's views on that? Any ideas on that? That's what we want to answer. Uh, you know that the study design, we are, try, uh, we are making a trial right now, and we are observing all the patients that were given uh, rituximab. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them are still in long-term remission. Problem here in Pakistan is that CD19 count is not easily available. I talked to uh, people of Shokat Sanam, and they said that they will do with flow cytometry, and they are going to charge 16,000 per test. And that's going to be very difficult for our patients to bear that. So uh, for us, we are just observing, uh, and uh, I don't know the answer, but uh, in future, we just like Manit said, uh, two and three, we may try to make a regime out of it where we divide the uh, patients into two groups one having six monthly uh, supplemental dose, and other just waiting for relapse or CD19, whichever we can use as a tool. All right, very good. So Dr. Adil Manzoor is chiming in that there is no data on FSGS um, on repeat dose, but actually there is a study that did exactly that. They looked at CD19 counts and they kept the, the B cells suppressed 
and they report a slight decrease in overall uh, remission rates in that group in which they, they suppress the B cells. But I think that's probably overkill. I agree that, uh, so B cell reconstitution after a dose of rituximab starts happening in four to six months. Uh, median time to relapse in minimal change slash FSGS after rituximab is eight to 10 months. So if you just look at B cell monitoring, uh, then you're probably gonna start dosing too many people who are actually not going to ever relapse. So I think at this point where, where we are with this, probably the best thing is once you've given rituximab, wait and watch and if they relapse, retreat them with whatever thing, whatever is appropriate. So in the interest of time, I'll keep scrolling through. Uh, so, it's fun, Dr. Yeah. Lagwala has raised his hand, so maybe you want to- oh, Yeah, ask. please, please. I, I, I can't see the chat when I'm doing this. So yes. I'm sorry, uh, just quick comments. Uh, CD19 levels, yes, we do. And uh, you, you just uh, uh, said the thing that, uh, you know, after a taxi map, it takes a few uh, months before you deplete all the CD20s. Um, the second thing uh, the, about the first case that uh, the cyclosporin, um, I, I thought that if you could just check the, the cyclosporin levels in a partial res partially responding patient, sometimes it's just uh, tweaking a little dose to get that target level of 120 or so uh, might do the trick. Yeah, so that particular patient is my patient. So they were always therapeutic. We maintain uh, cyclosporin 12 are trough levels of 125 to 200 generally in these patients. Or if we are doing peaks, we keep the peaks at 6 to 800. Uh, okay. But your point is very well taken. Your point is very well taken. So, you know, there were different types. And I think at that point, um, the patient was getting a little frustrated with the cyclosporin. It had been about three months and she'd had no response. So that's why we switched her back to steroids because we knew she responds very well to steroids and she did. So immediately after reinstitution of steroids, she dropped very, very quickly. And that is why as rest, at that point, since she was frequently relapsing, we, you know, so frequent relapse in most studies is defined as two relapses within 12 months. Um, so we ch chose to give her rituximab. So we'll find out how that turns out. All right, so this is another case. Uh, this patient presents with, I have to kind of see who they are. Okay, so this is again, one of Dr. Oranzeb's case. Um, presents with worsening edema for years duration. Um, serologies were negative, biopsy, four out of eight glomeruli with segmental inflammation. Immunofluorescence was negative, except for one plus IgM and one plus C3. We started on steroids, no clinical response with proteinuria. Trends were not available for the initial um, course. Then they were given a trial of MMF. The proteinuria decreased from 9.6 to 5.9 in one month, but withdrawn due to GI symptoms. And then they were given a course of rituximab, four doses. Again, I'm assuming 375 milligrams per meter square, along with 250 milligrams of solumedrol with each rituximab dose. And so it looks like, whoops, it looks like the proteinuria um, went down very nicely. So after six months, so this is much more like an FSGS response. Uh, proteinuria at six months is 0.5 grams per gram and the albumin has gone up from 2.1 to 3.5. So this is being presented as use of rituximab by Dr. Aurangzeb. Uh, in a patient who was resistant to steroids and uh, partial response to MMF, well, not a partial response, but semblance of a response to MMF, but intolerance because of, um, because of um, uh, GI side effects. Uh, classically, with somebody who's got reasonable renal function at this point, um, I think at this point, uh, the teaching would be to go to a calcineurin inhibitor um, so Dr. Um, Aurangzeb, you chose to use MMF and not a calcineurin inhibitor. What was the thinking behind that? Well, this was the patient who was referred to us and uh, after the use of MMF. And uh, oh, yes, yes. once the patient started to refuse to take medicine and uh, he wasn't willing to take any medicine, uh, he was more of oblivious to the fact that I'm having a disease 
So we offered uh, rituximab, we accept it, and that's about it. To totally understand. So, so that's kind of the scenario for this. All right, so I'm going to skip over this case. Um, all right, because I wanted to cover transplantation. Um, so this is a 19-year-old white male with FSGS diagnosed. This is one of my cases as well. Um, I've known this kid for quite a long time now. 19-year-old white male at the time uh, when I saw him first, diagnosed when he was uh, diagnosed with FSGS when he was eight years old, received a living related kidney transplant uh, donated by his father at age nine. Ten years later, so that's when I was seeing him, developed advanced telegraph dysfunction, biopsy showed advanced glomerulosclerosis, TG and FSGS. Uh, he received his second living related kidney transplant donated by mom preemptively at age 19. So first of all, uh, what do you guys think of this? Um, what was his risk for FSGS recurrence and would you have taken mom's kidney to preemptively transplant him? There would be different opinions on this. Probably not. Any, any transplanters in the, in the group? I'm sorry, uh, Ames, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I'm not transplanter, so I just, my opinion, it doesn't look like that. So, I mean, unless, I mean, not a good, not a good idea in my opinion, I mean, because. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Irfan, in this patient, I think that uh, the recurrence will ra rate will be very high, around 80% in this patient. And in your, uh, we don't have any options for the disease donor tra uh, transplantation, but taking a relative's kidney will be, you will be sharing the same cryptic epitopes so that will be not be a great idea in your setting. But if we need to transplant, probably we have to take such a risk. But yeah. how the recurrence and all the things, they're all debatable. So just to make a point, mm -hmm. the recurrence of FSGS in this particular patient, you know, in the first kidney, um, this was secondary FSGS. So he didn't have the immune factor mediated FSGS recurrence um, in his allograft, in his father's kidney. Um, he had excellent function for about seven, eight years, and then stopped taking his medicine. The usual teenage turbulence developed chronic allograft nephropathy and secondary FSGS. So his recurrence was not the, the, the recurrence that we had. In any ways, he was transplanted, uh, but this was vigorously debated at that time. And so he was induced with CAMPATH, maintained with standard triple immunosuppression, he was discharged post-operative day four. Urine protein creatinine ratio was two grams per gram. He was readmitted post-op day six with lower extremity edema and a urine protein creatinine ratio of 30 grams per gram. Oops. So what would you guys do now? Biopsy. Next. Mm -hmm. so he, the biopsy showed diffuse foot process effacement. That's what we would expect, right? So this is, in transplantation, we are actually able to oh. read the exact biological journey of this disease uh, because you see it before any FSGS lesion. The only thing that you see in these kidneys a week, 10 days after transplant is diffuse foot process effacement. So that's what we saw. Like uh, I think Adil had uh, chimed in, we started him on plasmapheresis and we actually gave him rituximab. He required plasmapheresis for two and a half months. And after that went into complete remission. Um, and when I say complete remission, his protein creatinine ratio was less than 300 milligram per gram. And uh, albumin was normal and he was maintained on standard triple immunosuppression after that. Interestingly, he's a kid. He had two acute cellular rejection episodes, years two or three, you know, post-transplant. Each time it was because he stopped taking his medicines and each time he would develop 10, 12 grams of protein. And during those, the only thing I treated him with was steroids for the acute cellular rejection and immediately his permeability would go down. And um, he maintains reasonable kidney function even now it's been 13 14 years now that he's out of transplant and he maintains reasonable kidney function his creatinine is around three and that's because he's had three or four rejection episodes and some damage because of that but his fsgs never came back after the initial um therapy that we provided him so again that underscores that both these treatments rituximab and plasma exchange 
Uh, well, rituximab, we don't really know. In some cases, it works. In some cases, it doesn't. Uh, but plasma exchange does not work in adult cases when you've got established FSDS. But in transplanted case, cases, it works really well. Um, and so there is this idea that if you catch these cases soon enough, you may be able to change the biologic outcome of this disease. So last and final, this is a 39 year old white female and I'm seeing her now. So your opinions would be, would be welcome. She's a 39 year old female with biopsy demonstrated FSGS complicated by nephrotic syndrome. The diagnosis was 12 years ago. She, uh, she was tried on steroids. She had a response, but then relapsed. And during the last 10 years, and I've not been seeing her, I'm seeing her now as transplant nephrologist now. She's had multiple courses of steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, abatacept, as well as rituximab. So she's had everything in the kitchen sink thrown at her. And in 2020, 12 years after her index diagnosis, She's got CKD5, now EGFR is 12 mils per minute. She's got 10 grams of protein and her albumin is 1.9. She wants to proceed with a preemptive living unrelated kidney transplant. What do you guys think? Should we do it? Should we not do it? How should we do it? What are her risks for relapse? Uh, Irfan, what does it mean by CB and, and nephrotic syndrome? What does it mean? Well, complicated by, I'm sorry. That's my stupid abbreviation, complicated by. So she had FSGS, which presented as nephrotic syndrome. So she had, you know, what I'm trying to say is she had the immune uh, factor related FSGS. Permeability related. But I think she can be offered a transplant with the, uh, her chances of recurrence are about 30%. And a live unrelated transplant or disease donor transplant is should be okay for him and which should go with a conventional regimen uh, so, in a standard in, uh, induction regimen with a triple immunosuppression regimen and initially keeping the tax slightly on the higher side, initially one to two months, so, around uh, 10. And that's hope for the best. So she actually right. came to the second opinion. She went to another transplant center first and the transplant center said, we need to take both your kidneys out. Oh, really? No. So, would you want to do that? No, I don't think Mayo Clinic uh, people have done it in the far inch uh, pediatrics, uh, but I don't think their uh, results are encouraging. Yeah, why would you take the kidneys out, actually? Why would you want to take the kidneys out? I think that the only logic in this patient will be the problem is in diagnosing post transplant FSGS. Because they, there is already proteinuria in this patient, so it will be difficult for them to pick up an early post-transplant recurrence. But usually after the first one month, this proteinuria and these transplanted kidneys usually goes away because of the decreased blood flow in the kidneys. But it will be difficult within the first month to pick up a new proteinuria. What they can do, they can quantify the baseline proteinuria and then they, they can look and on, is there any increase in the protein urea post-transplant? I, I, I think that's one reason and that's exactly right. You know, you, you have a lot of ambivalence post-transplant. You don't know where the protein is coming from. The other thing that the, the other transplant, which is a very good transplant center. So I mean, in, in different opinions are different opinions. Um, so they, they were worried that the albumin is too low and she's still nephrotic. So she would be hypercoagable and they were worried about um, thrombotic events, you know, uh, allograft thrombosis uh, in the immediate post-transplant period, which I think is not enough of a reason to take kidneys out. Actually, there's a, um, there's a consortium called Tango, which looks at GNs and so on and so forth. And they've looked at this in patients who've had nephrectomies done prior to transplantation, and the relapse rate actually goes up because it is thought that the old kidneys actually act as sponges for, for the circulating factor. So if you have less substrate for that, then more of that is going to home in into the transplanted kidney and cause a problem. So we plan to move forward with a preemptive living transplant, but what we are actually planning to do given her course is to start immunosuppression post-op day minus 10. So we'll start her, give her a running start 
um, and have a very low threshold for freezing her. Her actually, uh, I, I would suggest her relapse rate is going to be higher than 30%. So the 30% relapse rate that is quoted in the literature um, is diluted by the fact that that includes sometimes your adaptive FSGSs and your genetic FSGSs and other things which don't relapse. The only thing that actually relapses is the immune factor mediated FSGS. So if you just look at horses um, as, uh, at, at apples and not be confounded by the oranges, then the relapse rate of immune factor related FSGS is actually a little bit higher, 50% in the first transplant, 80% in the second. Um, so her risk is a little bit more than 30%, but I think um, she would definitely benefit from um, kidney transplantation and we'll hope um, to navigate her. The thing that makes me worried is that she has been resistant to everything known to men that can treat this disease. So if she relapses, uh, we would like to catch her very, very early and treat her very aggressively. I'm going to have any hope of being successful. So um, this is, I think, all the cases we have. Any final thoughts, questions, comments before we adjourn? Anybody wants to say something? And then I, I Regarding this last question. Yes. Please go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Doctor. I'm um, sorry. Doctor Abdul yeah. Masood has raised his hand. So. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. My question to uh, Dr. Umar is that, Umar, why you opt for, uh, in your lady the tacrolimus monotherapy? Because the studies for FSGS regarding the response uh, regarding complete and partial remission is better when it's accompanied by a low dose steroids, 0.15 milligram per kg body weight. Any yes, reasons sir. in that patient? Yes, 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 quickly. So I told her like options are prograph like tacrolimus with steroids or without steroids. I shared the data, but because of her bad side effects profile from steroids in the past, she absolutely refused to even talk about steroids. So we decided to try tacrolimus monotherapy. She responded very quickly. Within three weeks, she's back in remission. Thank so you. Patient uh -huh. choice. May, may I just give a comment? Um, about the, this recurrence of FSGS in transplants, uh, especially the child, um, in our experience, and uh, I think I've read this in literature too, that one of the key factors that can determine the uh, recurrence rate is the, uh, the progress of FSGS. If, it has if it's a steroid sensitive one, and if it has taken uh, you know, years to go into renal failure, then the chances of relapse uh, recurrence is, are quite low as compared to the ones who would rapidly go into ESRD within six months. And uh, for uh, the second case number nine, uh, what uh, you've said that you would start immune suppression uh, 10 days before, what we usually do at SIUT is we do plasma pharesis five days before the transplant and give a rituximab before transplant in such cases where you have evidence of uh, FSDS and you, uh, you have this proteinuria and you give them this and then you do the transplant. And the third uh, answer that I had for the preemptive uh, nephrectomies, uh, it's probably thought that if you remove those kidneys, you will uh, uh, decrease the proteinuria from the native kidneys and uh, the syndrome immediately after transplant. All, all, all well points. Any other thoughts? And, and I agree with you, uh, Dr. Dainwala, that uh, the, the rapidity with which FSGS sets in definitely is correlated with recurrence. And that probably tells you that there's a higher burden of that immune factor, which is going to chew up the transplanted kidney as well. So, good, hey, good. Irfan, yes. There is another question from Dr. Mateen Akram. Yes. Uh, is any data about ACTH? I have the same question because we know we have used ACTH or actor, not extensively, a lot of patients for membranous and now the a rep keep coming to us because there's an indication for FSGS also, but yeah. we do not use the ACTH for that. Any comment on that? Any study on that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's data on ACTH, but you know, ACTH has gotten so murky 
Um, you know, I, I don't know if friends in Pakistan know that one dose of ACTH, you can either get that or go buy a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, it's very, very expensive. And so if you're going to have somebody on therapy for six months, nine months, something with, uh, with Actar, that's very, very expensive. Um, so most of their data, when, when, when they're actually marketing this very, very aggressively, most of their data is like rituximab, it's case reports, case series. And when you p start parsing that data, um, it is not very strong, it is not very robust. So I have not yet used ACTAR for FSGS. I just don't feel that we are there. It's just to my mind for FSGS, a very expensive um, steroid substitute. Um, but right. I'm open to, uh, I'm, I'm biased against it. I, like in, I told you in the first thing, when, when I'm putting up questions, ACTAR is always the wrong answer, but I'm biased. I don't like the drug and I just think that they have marketed it uh, egregiously. Uh, there's really very little randomized controlled data on something which is this expensive. They should have better data than that. But I'm very I, I have the, I have the same feeling because it's so expensive medication and they're marketing so aggressively and I, I get like I get defensive about that. I need to be very, very convinced to use that. And now they're saying that because it's available in sub Q dose, it's much easier to use. Uh, I saw actually the other day a patient who is using this for sarcoidosis and she went into remission. Uh, with the uh, sub Q. Yeah, but I have some experience with ACTH and I would like to share that. Uh, back in Pakistan, we have uh, ACTH that is imported from India by the name of Actum Prolongatum. And uh, we used that uh, about uh, 18 months back and uh, for the four months we were able to use it then so due to some uh, Which one is it used for? Membranous or FSGS? Yes. What are you used for? Membrane? Yeah, I'm, I'm coming towards that. I'm coming towards that. We started with membranous and the result was good. But unfortunately, before we could uh, get a complete course of at least six months or so, we had to stop because of non-availability. And it wasn't that expensive, I should add to that, because 18 international dose was given and one uh, ampule was used for about three weeks, weeks time. So it was 5,000 rupees per three weeks. So in Pakistan, imported uh, ACTH from India wasn't that bad. Uh, well, except from uh, membranes, we used just, it. Let me just quickly interject. We're probably talking about different drugs. So ACTH has been around forever. I mean, we, we, we were using ACTH in the 1980s. This is Ektar gel, which is a slightly different formulation. So were you using, Dr. Aurangzeb, Ektar gel or ACTH? Because Ektar gel in I the U.S. Use. one shot is twenty-three thousand dollars. That's sweet. Go ahead. So I was using ACTH and we used it for FSGS too. So that's mm -hmm. really, really expensive that you told me. But in FSGS, the result was not that bad to begin with. But in, there was only two cases, and we were able to use that for three months. One of them did respond; other one did not. And I just uh, want to add a few more things. Uh, you rightly said that uh, there is a publication by us uh, regarding the rare responses, and that's true for me too. Like this uh, case that I shared regarding rituximab working in a steroid uh, non-responding patient. I think we used initially four cases who were not responding to steroid and uh, only one of them had a complete remission, one had partial remission, and two did not respond. So we are populating data, but my plea is that rituximab, according to uh, like uh, up to date, they are quoting a case series of 10 uh, cases of uh, steroid resistant FSGS, and then uh, uh, saying that rituximab cannot be used in any case of resistant FSGS, even at the last. And if for ACTH or gel, they are giving some encouraging remarks. And uh, I think uh, from Chicago, a group from Chicago is reported to be using XR gel successfully in FSGS. Uh, but yes, these are, were not randomized case control studies. These were case series. Plus, I was just curious about case number nine, Dr. Irfan. Uh, does botizumib uh, ring any bell? Can we use that in some cases? 
Um, no idea. When we are exhausted in all options? No idea. I mean, it is possible that this, this is plasma cells that are pushing this out. But since we don't know what that factor is, it's kind of hard to generate that hypothesis. I've never used bortezomib for resistant FSGS. I've used it in lupus, but I've ne never used it in uh, FSGS. Anybody else with uh, cortisome inhibitor experience in FSGS? Dr. Aurangzeb, have you used it, uh, bortezomib, in FSGS? Well, I haven't used it. I am used to experimenting few of the stuff, but this is not something that I've used because uh, it's available in Pakistan. But I need some data to convince myself to generate the hypothesis. I was just curious about another fact, sir. You were telling about the, the recurrence of FSGS in permeability factor-related FSGS. So let's suppose if somebody uh, is having uh, autosomal recessive FSDS with nephrine and codosine absent and he's being transplanted. What are the chances of that patient having uh, antibody associated uh, uh, directed against nephrine or codosine in the post transplant period? And that may lead to FSDS and uh, uh, protein we, urea. We actually what talked the about it last time. I mentioned that last time. And I've actually seen a case of that. They had antinephrine antibodies, which were causing FSGS, and we were able to freeze them out of it. So that can happen. And once time freeze is good, you don't no. have to do that again. But long phoresis, we were able to track the antibody levels. And so uh, the patient required phoresis and rituximab, and then the antibody went away, and then there was no recurrence. Pretty much behaved like anti-GBM. So as you, everybody on this call knows, once you treat anti-GBM, recurrence rates are very, very low. So, you know, something happens and it stabilizes the immune system. So in this particular case, we were able to do that, but that does happen. And I've been lucky to see one case. Any, any other questions before we were getting again to the two hour mark, which is something I wanted to avoid, but I think there was good discussion. We all learned a lot. Any final points before we, uh, Close the close the session. Yeah, just Irfan, one important point also I just want to emphasize that there should be a point of no return in patients with FSGS. That whenever you are starting any patient on calcineurin inhibitors, look, there is any vasculopathy on the biopsy. That patient may not do very well on calcineurin inhibitors with a lot of vascular changes on biopsy. The number two is once this, there is a lot of chronicity and creatinine is about in the range of three, probably no treatment will work. So not to immunosuppress this patient further and save the further immunosuppression for the transplant. So anybody from South America, I've heard, um, read a few studies in which they used ultra thin sections of the renal biopsy in method related uh, specimen and then uh, they were stained with toledin blue. And according to some, it is a replacement uh, to some extent for uh, substitution of electron microscopy. For a third world country like us, uh, case reports like that uh, seems to be very exciting. Anybody having experience like that? You probably in one of the future se sessions, you need to tell us more about that, Dr. Rangzeb. <clears throat> so that's that. I think, uh, I think it's 3 p.m. So, I mean, like yeah. I, no midnight, I think it's time to adjourn. I, 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 I had to say something I'm not saying. I'll keep myself there for next time. So th th three, three of us are on <laughs> call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And uh, and uh, we will... Uh, so the next session would be in um, October now, the first Sunday of October. And on popular demand, we will be dealing with lupus nephritis. And then the first Sunday in November, um, uh, we will... IGA? Actually, you know what? I can't do the first Sunday in November. It's my son's wedding. 
So uh, we, uh, he would probably want me there. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. The rest of the crew can probably do IG nephropathy. All right. Okay. Very good. Sounds good, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining and uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Love